And since Don is not here, we don't have to worry about that. So uh, just as a note, all of the pictures that you'll see here that aren't obviously uh, demonstration of how it actually works uh, have been generated by stable diffusion uh, with the prompt that you'll see uh, in the bottom there. Uh, and th this was, uh, the prompt was welcomed by Ansel Adams. So as if Ansel Adams took the photo, I don't know, I, I, I guess it is a na nature scene, but it's in color. So I, I don't know what it was exactly thinking here, but here we go. So, uh, welcome to the Linux user group. Uh, we're looking for people to talk about stuff and apparently also people to attend. So yeah. We need to figure out what, what went on here and why the, the world is the way the world is. But at some point, we probably should talk about officers or if we're going to exist or all those sort of uh, realistic things, as well as start planning out events here because come November, uh, depending on when the kid comes, uh, things could be a little bit distracted for a little bit for me here. So yeah. Uh, and this is the third Wednesday of the month, I think. So uh, we're meeting and yeah. And the photo here, the, the prompt was uh, penguins in Nighthawk. So as you can see, there's sort of the, the diner and a penguin. So- <laughs> At nighttime. <laughs> yeah, it, it worked. So this would be- <laughs> I'm sorry, that's too funny. So uh, <laughs> this would be the point that we talk about Linux news. So does anyone have any news to share other than apparently NVIDIA is uh, uh, going to be changing how they do cards? So not strictly Linux news, uh, other than that it's NVIDIA, which NVIDIA and Linux have, have issues. Um, as Linus Torvalds is not shy of mentioning, uh, but EVGA, who's you know one of the big names in NVIDIA cards, announced that they are ending their partnership with NVIDIA, which accounts for something like 80% of their revenue stream uh, because of their fights with NVIDIA and NVIDIA's allocation and supply chain issues that they are intentionally creating and doing nothing about. Uh, so EVGA is not going to have any of the new NVIDIA cards and is working to, yeah, and that, which is- well, the, the one the th one Linux huge news that I would say, I think I heard is, uh, I think the first Rust module got delayed to, I think, Linux kernel 6.1, which I think is kind of a, a big deal for, this is the first time they'll have a language that's like, I think not C or assembly. So, but I think they were planning on the next release, but then I think they delayed it now, so. I saw that there were articles, I haven't read the articles, but I saw that there were articles about Linus Torvalds using a MacBook M2 for some things. So I assume that that means. He also, he also supported. like uh, one of the things he said, I read uh, the interview that he had about that. And he, um, he, he cast aspersions on Pac-Man package manager. And I, I kind of had to like, like, I'm like, Linus, no, that's a bad take. Pac-Man's awesome. What are you saying? Why would you prefer Yum? What's wrong with you? Ooh, and he, he chose Yum. That, he chose Fedora. Awesome. He's like, he's like, I didn't want to use this, you know, one distro that's way better supported on M2 because they haven't used the the Pac-Man package manager, which I think is garbage. And uh, I, you know, I hacked together a version of Fedora. Uh, to to be able to work on it, and that seems to be working really well for me now. And because I really wanted the Fedora package manager, and I assume that's still Yum. And maybe it's maybe they've well, moved to something else. But, either but be Yum or uh, call DNF. it DNF now. Yeah. yeah, I mean to be fair, in my experiences with not Yum, but with DNF versus Pac Man, I would also pick DNF. But I, I disagree with that heartily, but uh, I haven't tried DMF, I guess, but uh, I mean, I'm also a Debian guy at heart, a, right? So yeah, apt all the I, things, but well, yeah, I, and well, yeah, we, we can take this offline, but I find Debian just far too slow. 
No, I got gotcha. you. And, and uh, just as a uh, uh, point of uh, checking here, uh, audio is coming across okay for those who are not in the room. Sounds good to me. Yeah. Silence yeah, is golden. Good. Sounds yeah, good. Anyways, I'm assuming he just doesn't like rolling release is maybe my guess, but I don't know for sure. Uh, anyways, yeah. Yeah, if he's using uh, uh, most of the DNF stuff, unless he's using the, the yeah, those are all rolling releases. Oh, well, then I have no idea what. Fredora is a rolling release now, isn't it? Really? That's amazing. I think. I don't that's, think so. That, 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 that blows my mind. Pretty sure because everything upstream of Red Hat is now. Uh, checking right now here. As of May, it was not. Oh, they're, okay. So they're still releasing versions. It's uh, uh, CentOS that uh, now is forced to a rolling. I thought CentOS went away and it became rocky. No. So CentOS is still a thing and they moved it to being a rolling release instead of just a clone of. Uh, Which is now. like. I feel like that's just like a big middle finger to like all the cheapskate admins that wanted a really stable operating system that was like Red Hat Enterprise, except not. Which is <laughs> why you had everyone migrate off into either Rocky or Alma Linux instead. Yeah. So CentOS discontinued is what I understood that in 2020 they announced it'd be done in 2021. So. CentOS version uh, uh, eight. CentOS eight uh, was end of life 2021 2022. What the product is now called is CentOS Stream, which is a rolling release, which more or less tracks the next release of RHEL for the version that it is. So they're using them as a pseudo fairly stable uh, test bed before it makes it into Red Hat. And they just like using the inertia using the inertia of people not wanting to move or whatever to, to, to get like some free beta testers. Awesome. I love it. But it hasn't well, been updated since 2021. So that tells me it is actually discontinued. No, CentOS stream is still very much a thing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's very, very much a thing. Uh, but there, there are people who are both okay with it and very angry about it. And then those of us who are apathetic. But so anyway, though, uh, the, that was the Linux news that was. Uh, uh, and uh, other than I did see that there was like a massive Python vulnerability that I didn't read much into, but it's been out for like apparently 11 years and nobody noticed. So yeah, uh, update your, your Python stuff, I guess. Uh, but the, the prompt that generated this was Linux News Impressionist. And how it came up with that, I, I guess that sort of impressionistic of computer stuff there on the side and maybe a news broadcaster, I guess. I, I don't know. Uh, magic. Uh, Shane, I don't know if you heard, but all of these images are uh, generated by uh, Stable Diffusion with the prompt as given. So... Are you running that uh, locally or running one of the services that does that? So I will we'll actually be running it here in a bit. Uh, I'm running it inside of uh, Google Colab just because uh, they give you a free uh, use of the GPU that isn't a potato. Sure. All of my GPUs are not up to snuff or not NVIDIA, so. Sure. But it was very much we, we went through and installed it. We'll install it on a Linux box and do all the Linux y things to it. So let, let's uh, go ahead and uh, I guess dive into the, the actual talk of what is it, what is stable diffusion, and where are we going? Uh, and as you can see, uh, the, the prompt of robot self photo realistic. Nah, not bad. It kind of nailed it. 
this one is not a I, I did ask it for a photo of me and it, it, it yeah it wasn't me so yeah uh, uh, and apparently sample footer text still made it in that's what I get for not reading my slides ahead of time Tuesday February 2 20 XX yeah uh, so anyway though templates yay uh, so Machine learning and artificial intelligence, depending on how old the person is you're talking to, you'll hear both of them uh, batted around. As far as I, I'm concerned, they're sort of interchangeable. Uh, there's been a whole bunch of, and yes, I know, Stephen, you're gritting your teeth there, but uh, th there have been a bunch of different things through the years here that we've talked about uh, on the internet uh, between deep fakes, sort of subbing in and making it look like uh, Donald Trump's actually eating McDonald's when he was having parties instead or something like that. I don't know why. Oh, it's scandal. Uh, photo enhancement. So say you have a fairly low resolution picture and you want to make it bigger or uh, you, you have like really low resolution film and from the, the 1900s and you want to upscale it to 4K and make it colorized. They, there's stuff that can help do that. You can classify and say, well, the, this person's happy, this person's sad, this is a face, this is so-and-so. And then also the one that we're going to care about tonight is making photos from text prompts. Uh, you can also do things like uh, generating photos. Uh, this person doesn't exist, this cat doesn't exist, this uh, startup doesn't exist. And uh, many thing more, may, many more different models out there. Uh, the one, one of the better spots to look for the free and sort of uh, community driven ones uh, is the the website uh, Hugging Face. Uh, well, it depends and, on when in the 1900s, but yeah. Yeah. Uh, so the the one I was thinking of was uh, a film, one of the first motion picture films of like a train coming through into a station in uh, Paris, if I remember right from a couple of years ago, and it, it was pretty rough. In black and white, I'm guessing. Yeah, in black and white, and they upscaled it and uh, people, of course, they will we'll talk about how it sort of makes up stuff out of, uh, thin air so uh it went from people's faces where you could barely see them to they, them actually having faces now, of course were they the real faces of the people there no they weren't do, do they look convincing yeah for the most part but yeah so anyway though uh uh so they there are um, let, let's talk more about image generating prompt models uh, the the one that sort of lit the the world on fire was uh, Dolly, and uh, the the biggest problem with it is that it is even though it's made by a uh, group with the name Open uh, Source in their their name, uh, it, it is very much opposed uh, for uh, charge sort of uh, thing, and they do tightly restrict you that you can't use like. Uh, recognizable public figures to make them do things like, I don't know, the president accepting a bribe or something like that, where you'd maybe be uh, smirking the, uh, the person's good or bad name. Uh, then sort of the, the next one that uh, picked up was this uh, Dolly Mini, uh, which then, uh, because uh, Dolly had some issues with the, the fact that they were using their name, uh, became uh, Cran instead. Uh, you, Mid Journey is another one out there. And then uh, here within the last couple months was uh, Stable Diffusion, which is free. You can download it off the internet and it's an open source. Uh, they, the, uh, the actual, uh, we'll look at the, the card here in a minute on uh, Hugging Face, but uh, uh, other than the, the fact that there's some restrictions that you're, you're not supposed to do bad things with it, uh, it's uh, very, very much open. And so uh, anyone can make their own thing that's like stable diffusion. 
they, there are whole data sets around. It was trained off of this uh, uh, Leiam uh, aesthetics uh, data set which is a very large crawled uh, data set that was out on the internet. And uh, they used uh, 256 NVIDIA A100 GPUs hosted out on AWS and used about 150,000 GPU hours worth of uh, calculations to train this uh, model. And if you too have $600,000, you can train it yourself too. But the good news is they've already done it for you and you can get it for free. So free is good. And uh, what, what sort of kicked it off and started it, of course, there was a uh, paper, uh, the high resolution image synthesis with latent diffusion models. Great read if you want uh, to read it, but it came from uh, Germany, uh, some very nice folks, and as part of their thing, they also released their uh, the, the models behind it, so you too can do whatever you want with it. So how does it work? Magic, token magic. But let, let's dive into the actualities here because. Uh, so it's actually three different models uh, working in concert. A variational autoencoder, which basically just takes pictures from your image space and then transforms it into a latent space that is a lower resolution uh, representation of that image. Uh, I'd recommend reading Wikipedia if you want to dive deeper into that and possibly getting a degree in math because holy cow. Uh, then it is paired with a UNET encoder, which basically just takes uh, sort of like if you've ever looked up at the, the sky and said, man, that cloud really looks like a face. Well, that's pretty much what it's doing is uh, monkeys at the, the typewriter slowly steering its way into having the right image. We'll, we'll dive into it here in just a little bit. bit. And then there's a text encoder that basically gives the helps inform the UNET uh, model what it's actually supposed to be looking for in that random noise. So if you wanted to get a picture of a person half Yoda, half Gandalf, this is a, and that did not come across very well, but in the slides here, you can go to the blog post that uh, explains how it actually works a lot more in depth, but basically it uh, embeds this uh, this model or this text that you're looking for, and then just keeps uh, denoising it through that uh, UNET decoder until you end up with something that looks like a half person, half Yoda, uh, or a person who's half Yoda and half Gandalf. And as you can see, it didn't do a terrible job at it. So basically what happens is you start out with a whole bunch of images that are uh, that have descriptions. So this would be like a bunch of peaches sitting on a table. And then each time it trains it, it uh, they add more each step, more noise. And then once they get out to a certain point, then they, they teach the model how to denoise it back going the other direction. So you repeat this with thousands upon billions of images and eventually you end up with this magical thing that you put text in and you get half Yoda, half Gandalf out. And the whole goal is that you start out with a picture, you encode it, decode it, and you get something that looks pretty much like the same picture, just sort of like Pet Cemetery. It comes out just a little bit wrong sometimes. And likewise, you go keep adding noise each step, and then you let it walk its way back until you come up with something that looks close to the same image over again. But not the same image. So uh, there was a great write-up on Hacker News uh, yesterday. Uh, I recommend going out and reading it, but the, the person was actually using stable diffusion to help be used as a... Uh, uh, compression algorithm for uh, images. And as you can see, they were able to take uh, fairly uh, 
interesting diverse photos and while they they don't end up quite right they, they end up being really really small uh, so we'll dive into and as you can see here this is the jpeg version of it and it definitely there is some pretty nasty uh, artifacts in there webp did a far better job and then stable diffusion it looks right until you look a little bit too close at it we'll, we'll dive into that in just a second but it did better at the candy shop version and then if you look here, uh, the couple big things that show up really bad is not, not being uh, coming out right is the uh, uh, Anna, the, the llama, I think, or something, uh, had something written on her halter there, and it totally ends up bizarro land, as well as if you notice the heart is solid in the other two, and there's a little bit of a... Uh, Nice little uh, image flare there of uh, light on the top of the heart. So, like Pet Cemetery, it comes back just a little bit wrong. Uh, where that becomes really, really concerning is let's take this picture of uh, Los Angeles. And as you can see, even though it's pixelated, you can tell there are buildings in the right places that you'd expect if you knew what you were looking at in San Francisco. I mean, personally, it's all gibberish to me, but when you look in here at the horizon in stable uh, diffusion, you end up seeing that it just sort of makes it up as it goes along, and those buildings aren't actually real, but it just sort of makes it up and adds them as it sees fit, which is a problem, depending on what you're trying to do. Uh, it especially becomes apparent if you try and encode text, like a screenshot of uh your phone or something you end up with just a little bit of bizarro land uh and that, that text isn't real uh there was one big example where it was a really bad problem for i think it was a fax machine fax copier that the algorithm they used to compress it would occasionally swap numbers and change stuff <laughs> Genius. Uh, one of the really big problems that you can run into is if you're using this to encode, say, a CAT scan machine uh, image and you're looking for cancer or something like that. Well, if you trained it on a whole bunch of uh, people with cancer, it may make up cancer where there is none, or it may hide the cancer because it says, oh, you know, that, that looks like a healthy lung to me. So what's the point of using it is compression, isn't it? Wouldn't the latency required to retrieve it from storage be? So the, the idea would be that, uh, for example, these, if you want to get a super compressed image, so the, this photo of uh, San Francisco yeah. ends up being 4.9 KB versus uh, this absolutely pixelated crappy image in a JPEG is six. KB. Right. But where is it practical that you would need that minor difference in compression and have a GPU on the other end to output the original image? Or maybe the you're the maybe you're the Chinese government and you want to have a profile picture of, you know, all billion people you have and you want to fit it on a cell phone or something. Or uh, another interesting use has been talking there. There's been talk of possibly trying to use it for uh, video compression, for video conferencing, or stuff like that, where you can- But uh, could it decompress in real time? You'd yeah, have to have I mean, a big it, GPU. It, I no, think it, it, it's, maybe. it's just a JPEG. Like the magic is the fact that it's rendered a JPEG that's visually like not, not visually too dissimilar from the original while still being compressed. Yeah, so uh, ba basically what you do is send the equivalency of a prompt to the uh, encoder on the far end, and then it would generate uh, the, the image out of the, the trained model, basically. So, uh, you but see the model would take a long time to, 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 to the re inference is, is still kind of, uh, it takes a lot longer to run an inference on a, on a text string than it does to just low JPEG or like JPEG bits off a disk is I think the concern, right? Yes. But so no, no, one thing, 
one thing that's constantly you know evolving over time though is it's like a truism that CPU speeds increase much faster with memory speed generally, uh, and and much much faster than disk speeds. So uh, you know it may be that you know you know the as the trend lines carry out, it might it might you know make more and more sense. Uh, so it's sort of like how like HEVC works, like uh, even a few years ago versus now, like it would take you a long time to encode like a video with uh, HEVC, but now you can do it significantly faster. And the same was true of, uh, you know, X64 when it first came out. But what, one of the other uses that has that sort of been batted around is for like audio encoding. So you have a super, I mean, if you have very low bandwidth uh, audio, you have a very tinny, crappy recording. And this could, make that better yeah it'd be interesting to pair this with something like a vocoder exactly the, okay sort of, yeah okay. yeah but like it might say it's a totally different word than you intend it to or something right yeah that, that's where the risk is and that, that's why it's a major call out here uh one, one other really big ethical dilemma that the world is uh, sort of struggling with right now is a lot of these models were all trained using copyrighted uh, information. And so is it actually a violation of copyright to uh, uh, ask for, say, a uh, Jackson Pollock painting of a guy drinking a Budweiser? Fair use. Uh, that, that is where it's a big question. And so, like, say you're you're an artist, and your your pictures went into the training set, and someone asks for something that looks like your art, instead of buying it from you. Ethically, is there a problem there? We're still sort of dealing with it. I know uh, Getty Image uh, uh, repository just straight up said that they are no longer accepting any AI generated images at all partially because the thinking was they're setting themselves up for a lawsuit uh, against the, the people who generated all of this stuff because they used some of their stuff. So yay, uh, that's gonna be a fun uh, thing here in the next few months. But so anyway though, we're to the point that we're ready to start uh, playing with uh, some of these uh, things and setting up a Google Colab uh, notebook, which is basically just a glorified Jupyter notebook with a little bit of Google's magic sauce around the edges. So as a warning, uh, these models have been uh, trained from photos on the internet, uh, only excluding things that are uh, very blatantly illegal or uh, issues like this that. This meeting is being recorded. Little, oh, that's you. That was okay. me. Uh, I'm so, joining from my phone. Sorry. Oh, no, no worries. Uh, so uh, the, uh, the, where was I? Uh, so the, the images uh, include things that are less than savory. And uh, uh, so rule 34 applies to their data set. We, which is that to basically sum it up there there is uh, if you can think of it there is porn on the internet of it so those images did make it in there there is a filter to stop uh, those from showing up when they get generated however this is a live demo and bad things could still happen so yeah uh, so good luck, uh, and uh, hopefully we'll try and uh, stop that from becoming too much of a problem. But I will share out this. Uh, uh, oh, apparently I need to reshare my screen. Okay, so here we are in a copy of the Google uh, collaboration notebook. I will share this out, but uh, basically just to show that we're running on a NVIDIA and it will warn you that uh, this needs a high RAM environment. They're lying, it works. <laughs> 
it probably runs faster with a uh, high RAM environment, but that, that actually costs money. So yeah, we're, we're going with the shoestring budget here. But as you can see, we have a GPU attached here with the, uh, the command prompt NVIDIA SMI. We're looking at what's going on here and uh, you can see that it's, uh, it has CUDA 111.2 installed on it and uh, it uh, really isn't doing uh, too much right now, but it's a, a T4 uh, Tesla uh, GPU and yeah, it, nice little thing. Uh, so next we're going to want to install uh, the package diffusers as well as SciPy and a couple others. So we're just going to run pip install and the, these things on here, as well as to make sure that the uh, iron pie, uh, pie widgets uh, are installed so we can have uh, some nice to haves like being able to view images. And so if you just want to run this from home instead of running it on Google, you can run the, this notebook inside of Jupyter because really, like I said, it is still just Jupyter. So as you can see, we're installing a bunch of stuff here. We'll take it a second. Thankfully, it looks like most of the stuff I'm doing is already satisfied because uh, it came with a default image here. And I believe we're done now. So as you can see that it wasn't too painful. Uh, and then we also need to, uh, just for Google stuff uh, to enable uh, custom widget manager stuff here. And then we have to log into the Hugging Face uh, uh, hub because uh, uh, they, the people who have created this model want to be able to know who's using it and communicate back with you if, as they update with newer versions. So if we go here, and I should be able to go to this. Okay, that's not playing nice with me here. I'm going to have to quick sign into uh, the, the Hugging Face uh, tokens page here. And I've stopped sharing, so you can't uh, bogart my uh, token here. And let me turn back on. Boo, it's no fun. Okay, so I'm pasting. Let's hit share again. You also lost HDMI at some point. I don't know if that was oh, intentional. That was not intentional. Thank you for the heads up. I mean, I can see it on my phone. I'm the other one here, so it's not a huge deal. There we go. Okay, we're back again on in the room here. And so I paste my token in, I hit login. And there you can see that it was successfully logged in. And so then the next thing that we want to do is to uh, download the uh, model files. And uh, they basically, we can just copy that directly from the, the Hugging Face uh, uh, page. And so if we just take a look here at the, the model card here that comes with it, as you can see, there's the folks who uh, generated it, some information that uh, on how they generated it. And then here's all the different mix-ins that other people have created with it. And how to cite it if you're doing a scholarly paper. They have examples of how to actually install it, which is pretty much what I ended up using to create all this stuff. And then it uh, warns you that this is for research purposes only and uh, that, that you shouldn't use it for out of scope use uh, to make factual or real representations of people or other bad malicious things. Of course, the, the amount of uh, 
the force that this actually has is uh, almost none. So yeah, you'll get a strongly worded letter from the UN basically uh, if you use it wrong. And the fact that uh, this is generated uh, off of photos from the internet that will be biased. So uh, we'll find that out here in a minute when we ask it for a photo of a Linux users group. If it's as bad as the, the one that I generated earlier today, it is very cringeworthy because it was a bunch of uh, middle-aged white guys all standing in a row uh, as a group photo. So yeah, uh, so we're almost done downloading here. I mean. And we're done downloading, cool. It's not wrong, but. I was gonna say in this, at least current attendance. Yeah. Uh, but so anyway, though, the, the next thing you want to do is uh, switch it over so it's using the GPU instead of the CPU because otherwise things are slow. And so uh, then let's generate a picture of a photo of an astronaut riding a horse. It seems to be their Hello World default version. And as you can see, while we have a GPU, it's not the best GPU in the world, but it's still faster than if you're using one of the, the services to generate it where you have to wait in line. And the photo we end up getting here is a picture of an astronaut riding a horse. Ish. Kind of. <laughs> so let, let's just ask it for something different. Uh, uh, Winning lottery numbers. Linux group photo. Just for the, the fun of self-deprecation here. See, and this speed is where I was thinking it was not very practical for uh, compression. Yeah. Because you might as well just wait for the photo to download it then full res at that point. And the, this is one of those things where... Oh, wow. Is this like no, a Red Hat conference photo or something? Come on now. <laughs> if you don't need like real time and you're talking like a CDN, your bandwidth savings could be pretty significant. Or if you're doing something like tape storage, right? You wanna you wanna archive this for five years and you don't know if you're ever gonna pull it out, but you know you might want the chance to maybe have a little bit of an idea. Yeah, yeah. So let, let's just ask it one more time, just because I'm curious if because each time you end up with a different uh, photo here. And also realize that the, this is uh, a free GPU, so the, it's not the, the best and the brightest. But there, so as you can see, it is a photo of a bunch of white guys standing around. But uh, just like Pet Cemetery, everything comes back just a little bit wrong. So zoom in a little bit, look at some of the faces on that. Yeah, and they uh, some people that don't even have a body, it looks like it's just a head and neck. Yeah, let's uh, tab and just like the dynamic, you know, super scaling or whatever that NVIDIA is so proud of, don't look at it too closely. Yeah, the, there there be uh, nightmares. But yeah, so anyway, though, it, it, that's some like this cat does not exist nightmares. <laughs> Looks more like Walking Dead. Yeah, so you, you can uh, change your prompt a bit. Uh... <laughs> I don't think it knows what Linux means. What if you just ask it for, for Linux? Uh, let, let's find out. Or Linus Torvalds talking to NVIDIA. Interesting. That's not awful, honestly. No. It's a very it's a very abstract idea. 
That circuit board needs a better pick and place machine, but I've seen worse. It might even work. <laughs> it might. Pop it in a reflow station just to be safe. But yeah, so asking for a Linux impressionist. Oh boy. As we take acid here, apparently. Uh, but yeah, so any anyway, though, the, the, as you can see, you end up with uh, very interesting uh, sort of things. Uh, and if you want to be reproducible, you can actually feed it a manual seed that will always uh, get you the, the same spot. So if you saw the, the picture of the, the astronaut riding a horse before, oh, because we, we clobbered uh, the astronaut riding a horse and set the prompt as Linux Impressionist, we, we ended up with the, the weird thing. But uh, yeah, so uh, let's just change that back to astronaut riding a horse. Why not Linux writing a penguin? Uh, <laughs> or an astronaut writing a penguin. <laughs> astronaut writing a penguin. Okay. Let's ask for that and then we'll take that one off. If it has Linus Torvalds in the astronaut suit, I tell you what. Yeah, that's a little weird. Talk about pet cemetery. Wow. So yeah, that ends up being sort of an astronaut uh, penguin. But <laughs> so to prove the point, though, if you rerun this again, rather than uh, rolling the dice, you end up with the same freaky penguin uh, drawing. And then if you change that to 1023, then it'll be something different, but it'll be reproducible at 1023. Yes. Okay. So see, there you have the same thing again. So let's... How many different values can that seed take? Uh, max int. So effectively infinite for the purposes of generating images, but yeah, not I mean, actually infinite. Ba basically, you're just seeding the pseudo random number generator with a uh, input there rather than just trusting that it's going to grab random. So as you can see, there's a slightly different version, but if we ask it to reproduce it again, and so the, the intent had been also that I was going to show Google has a uh, model that they've trained where if you feed it a JPEG, uh, it will actually do OCR. Uh, based off of uh, the symbols that it's trained. So like if you have a large legal document that is a scanned PDF, uh, this would be interest for uh, Chad if he was here, uh, that you could turn it back into text. Google is very good at OCR in general. Yep. So anyway, though. They automatically run OCR on attachments to your Gmail. And there you can see that uh, if you uh, in, uh, increase the number of inference steps, you get uh, a better picture each time. But the more steps you take, the more uh, uh, cost there is in time. So let's just change this back to something that we uh, know will be a good because the, the penguin prompt seems to be throwing it for a loop. <laughs> so going back to ast astronaut rides horse. There you can see we're back to something that's a little more sane, but uh, at 
only 15 inferences. You can see it runs a lot faster. And you end up with something that's a little more weird. That is amazing. But if we up it to 50, which is their, their recommended level, and it re, uh, renders here, you can see that you end up with something that's a little more high quality. Okay, what if you go like 300? Does it, does it, like what's their default? Is their default 50? 50 is their default. Oh, see, that so, looks a lot worse than the, the first one. So I'd be curious about like 300, 100, something. Let, let, let's see 100 first because I have a feeling 300 is going to take just a little while to uh, <laughs> run. Here. It'll take six times as long. It'll be about a minute. I think there's diminishing returns in everything. So I wonder where their diminishing returns are. Yeah, they, yeah that's what yeah, I'd be the, curious about. I'm, I'm not sure. But other uses of this is to take like satellite imagery and uh, up the resolution of it. But of course, with that, if you enhance it too much, you, you end up just making up uh, features out of old cloth. That looks like the same thing. Yeah, so that's where you get di diminishing returns. Eventually, it just said, oh. <laughs> It crashes. Uh, apparently, 200 is a uh, bridge too far. Uh, let's try 150 instead. That likes it better. So with the satellite imagery, though, I wouldn't necessarily use this for like in a, in a practical application, right? I wouldn't want to use this to increase the resolution. What I would do is I would train it on something like the James Webb telescope that only measures IR and radio waves or whatnot. And I would train it to create those colorized images automatically rather than having someone manually read in the data and do the whole artist interpretation thing. Yeah, that, that's entirely a possibility too. And what you do would be to rather than using stable diffusion to do your training, you have some a, a model that you trained specifically on increasing resolution sort of stuff. But so as you can- But you could start, you like transfer learning is a, is a big deal in, in machine learning circles. So you could start yeah. with stable diffusion and then like transfer learn, you know, train it specifically, you know, customize the, the base model to, to well, telescopes. One, one thought I'd have would be that you could uh, train up on more uh, near Earth objects that you have like Hubble uh, telescope data on, and then maybe use that to uh, basically transfer. So James Webb is seeing stuff that's way, way far beyond what you can see with Hubble. What would that object look like if Hubble could see it? But Hubble's an optical telescope, isn't it? Yeah. So take and uh, say, okay, this is what the IR image looks like. Oh, I see what you're saying. Okay, yeah. Use use a, a basically a correlation matrix and say, here's what Hubble sees, here's what James Webb sees, and do that for all the 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 ones that you can basically see with a naked eye, just can't see very well, and then for the James Webb stuff that's way out there, I'd be like, okay, what, what the hell? Okay, I'm following. It, it seems like an interesting idea. I don't think we have enough data yet to be able to do that, but- And you'd probably to... want an alternate telescope that doesn't have quite the magnification of James Webb. Yes. Why? You're gonna, you're gonna have to downsample it anyways, and James Webb is super expensive. Just, just, just let it go. Let it go forward. Just well, because like, like I say, since it's since it's in the IR anyway, you're just. I mean, yeah, but I mean, yes. The, well, the first step for pretty much every uh, like deep learning model that I've ever seen that actually works with the shit is uh, is yeah. downsample the living heck out of it. Yeah, and, and so then the other knob that you can turn is uh, changing uh, how how much uh, guidance uh, it has. 
So basically, the, the bigger the number uh, will make images that look good, but it, it won't be as creative as it does it. So it, as you can see, <laughs> you end up with, uh, and then you can also say, hey, I want a grid of three images so that you don't have to sit around and wait is another option. Uh, and there's where you can get to be a, a whole bunch of, but of course, the, the more you run, the, the longer it takes to run. Because as you can see, it's going to take it a little while to generate. It's actually not bad. I mean, it's already at 20 some percent. What is that unit measurement? 1.2 something what per second? Uh, iterations. Oh, okay. It's not bad. No, and part of it is I think uh, most of the cost is uh, loading in the model and transferring it over to the GPU. In GPU itself, it's, oh, okay. So yeah, that is gonna be bad because- Oh yeah, that was just the first range. one. Okay, so, fair. Yeah, we're not gonna sit around and wait for that. But uh, you can also make non-square images if you want uh, by giving it a height and a width. But uh, yeah, and then uh, this is where they're diving into just exactly how all that stuff works. And how you could write your own pipeline to use diffusion to, to make uh, other stuff. But, uh, and this is the part where you do need the more memory uh, then because you using a model once you've uh, generated it is nice and fast, uh, not uh, so here here's an example of uh, where I asked for uh, the prompt was bad GPU as I was trying to create a, a joke about it because I asked for like potato and all sorts of stuff like that. And the one thing to, to call out here is I'm using torch vision transform to uh, resize my image so that it looked better on the slideshow. But uh, bad CPU, the, the one that ended up getting generated, apparently that CPU was very naughty because it triggered the uh, not safe for work uh, content filter. And so instead we got a big black uh, square instead. Where if like say I know, uh, uh, and potato hopefully won't be nearly as uh, uh, not safe for work. So there is actually instructions on the internet if you're so inclined to go out and uh, uh, turn off that not safe for work uh, filter, but uh, you're going to end up with stuff that isn't necessarily worth uh, ogling either. And knowing the internet, there are probably instructions on completely reversing it rather than just turning it off. Uh, so one, one of the, I, I did see, I think it was on uh, Hacker News that someone has created a uh, sort of like this space doesn't exist uh, uh, system where you can give it prompts for uh, what, what kind of uh, not safe for work images you'd want. Of course. Welcome to the internet. Yeah. So anyway, though, Bill Gates. Uh, potato, Bill Gates potato, not bad. It's Bill Gates as a potato. <laughs> I can't complain. He's got two different colored eyes, but I can't complain. And, and as you can see, it's upscaled, uh, but not, not, uh, not quite uh, right. But yeah, so anyway, though, that, that was uh, sort of, how to play around with something that's been uh, all around in uh, um, sort of the news and uh, the, the hacker uh, world and you two can run it and play around with stuff uh, on your uh, local or free uh, uh, machine learning uh, stuff. Fancy. So we'll hit stop share here.
Yeah. Oh, uh, Linux. I just don't know what's coming. <laughs> you know what? Let, let's find out. We, we hit. So one of the interesting things I found in playing around with the freely available but not open source ones is that the more specific you get, the less useful the output is. If you can give it one to three words, it seems to do best. Yeah, and if you give it guidance on just exactly what what style of painting you're or drawing you're looking for. We may have a first quote. Yeah, you got it. There we go. Let, let's find out what Linus uh, climbing out of his well to uh, shame mankind actually ends up looking like. Watch it be the cartoon character. I mean, um, I couldn't expect anything better. Yeah, I, I'm not really surprised. Uh, not uh, coming through on the remote too well. Oh. Uh, let's try copy and paste into the chat. Just base 64, drop the whole base 64 string in the chat. Is that better there or is it not uh, screen sharing at all? Oh yeah, you killed the share. There we go. Okay. I, I intended to kill the recording since we were kind of 